I mean, you see so many pitches every year, right? Forget not forget just on the show in life, right? <laughs> I mean, I came to bed. How many pitches do you get a day? <laughs> no, people, right. So, so people just stop you. Hey, I've got the next greatest, right? So they're in love with their own stuff. What's the thing that people aren't entrepreneurs are overlooking? They're it's the blind spot. What do you see? I don't know there's a blind spot because I think, you know, and I may be too close to it. I, we talk about this stuff all the time um, in so many different variations, right? The passion of it, the origin of it, the willing to take no. Uh, you know, listen, I think that if I would, if I would, if I would, if I would really drill down, and again, like I know you want to talk about things that we don't talk about, but I talk about it sometimes. Um, if I really would have drilled down on what people don't, understand or overlook is that they hack themselves enough to drill down on their why meaning i'll give you an example barbara and i have invested in several people on shark tank and i always say or not always and sometimes i say barbara this person doesn't want a company this person wants to be famous so i always say that the three things that are keys or are important to success and you can't you can't overlook any one of the three things. And the number one is the why. And everybody goes, oh, this is your why. No, because number two is what goals are you going to set? And number three is how are you going to educate yourself? But if you overlook the why, no, I ain't that serious. Well, then you're going to set the wrong goals. If you set the wrong goals and you don't know where to go get the proper education. So you want to do it because of money. And don't say you're trying to help people. You know, con men and con women. They know their why. I want to steal from you. <laughs> I want money. I have nothing of value to sell you, but you know, a, a lie. And I'm going to make money. They're very clear on their why. Yeah. But when you're out there saying, "Well, I want to save the kids," or "I want to do this and that," or "and I want to do all this," and you don't know your, you know, you don't, you, you know, you're 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 trying to paint it as something different, you know. So, so that's what I really think it is, you know, and sometimes your why and often it, it's not, it's not an easy thing to address, but your why could be because you were abused as a child and you, you feel that, or you were neglected, or you want to be that person for your father or your mother, because either they were bad to you and you want to show them you're better, or uh, they just told you, you were this, you were never going to make it. Or they always said, Oh my God, you know who the most successful people are. They do this. And then you decided that you want to prove to them something wrong. And it's not even something you want to do. So, I mean, so look, so you came, you came from Brooklyn and Queens. I came from Brooklyn and Queens. We're about a decade apart. I, I, I got a little head start, So I, so I got my knees scraped a little bit earlier than you. <laughs> So, so the thing is, is, you know, not, I mean, neither of us came from like a, 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 a place of wealth. We came from, we came from a, homes that we had to like bust some ass to make our, make means connect, you know, sometimes it was hand to mouth. And I'm curious because, I mean, we talked a little bit about this. We were working on, working on the book, you know, that, that book project. For me, I did not have anyone who is in my family that was a really good entrepreneurial model that I could say, wow, and watch and learn. So I had to kind of learn as I went, right? And oh man, and I had my highs, I had my lows, all that kind of stuff. Was, was yours similar or did you actually have a mentor that you were able to tap into and go, wow? I mean, because I know you had mentors as so you went on, but how'd that go? No, I didn't have anybody that um, was actually operating or running a business. My mother had an entrepreneurial mindset, but she she wasn't, you know, she didn't she wasn't fortunate enough to have a lot of success with it, but she kept trying. But she had street smarts. I mean, I, right. I, I and spoke she kept her testing mind. herself. Exactly. Yeah. No. And 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 that's what I I, I very much love those conversations with your mom because she's. 
she's a firecracker, man. She's just like, yeah. she's just like <laughs> and the, but she had the street smarts and she had the hustle. She, she, and that's the thing that those of us that had to kind of live or die on, you know, by our own actions, you know, it was feast or famine. She was one, she had the resilience and she had the bounce back. And that's yeah. like, okay, you can knock me down. The one thing that you can't stop happen is I'm going to keep getting back up. You right. Know? Right. For sure. You know, and I love that factor of the why agreed the factor of what you're going to do agreed. But the one thing that I hear that you say much more than many entrepreneurs is the educational part. Mm. And that's, and that's what I, I actually authentically love about that. Cause I am very, I very much was the same in that. Ooh, something sparked me. And I was like, why did that, you know, what, what happened there? And I was curious enough to want to know more. And I know you always leaned into it and you had the wonderful melting pot of tons of different cultural, like, like people from, you know, Jewish and white and black and this and that. You had all of these different influences. Was that always with you from, from the beginning, that, yeah. that inclination to want to learn? Mm, um. Yeah, I was always fascinated, um, but I never, I never, I, I knew it was much harder for me to absorb it in the traditional form due to the fact that I was dyslexic. Um, so reading was very hard to hard for me. So, but I knew that I can get information. And I know I noticed that when I did read, um, I was so much more intelligent from reading in between the lines, reading what they said, reading it again because I was dyslexic. And I just found that it just it just gave me so much more power or confidence in what I was doing. Sometimes it stopped me from what I was doing because I was like, wait a minute. Now that I found out I'm doing the wrong thing. Right. Right. Um, but it was always a, it was always a combination of uh, absorbing the information and then going out and trying and executing it kind of Nike. Just do it. Yep. Um, and, and I found my best results whenever I. I applied whatever I read or tried it and didn't wait for the time to be perfect. Didn't wait for some way to give me the authority to do so. Um, and, and that's where I found I, I, got, I gained the most grounds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think for those of us that have had to, we didn't come from some MBA school of thought or anything like that. We learned by doing you know, we'd screw up. We go, oh, oh shit, that didn't work. Okay. Or we do this and we go, oh, that, that worked better. Um, what, I, what I found worked, and I'm curious on your take on this, is I would tend to lean in on like, well, why couldn't that be done? And just probably just because of complete naivety. Like I actually didn't, I had no clue how much of my ask I was actually considering. So I was like, well, why not just try blah? And I would just do it. Um, and then- I think, you know, then 25, 30 years later, I'm going, oh, <laughs> that took a hell of a lot of balls, right? Because, right, right, right. I, you know, I, I, had, I didn't know how big the ask was. I just kind of did it. Right. Is that, I'm curious if that's been true for you as well. I can't necessarily say that that is true for me because I usually used to, um, I used to try to put as many things together and bake it as much as I can so that the ask doesn't seem too great. You know, so the people did not have to risk too much. Mm -hmm. So they would be they would be quicker to say yes, because it wasn't that big. Right. Right. So you're willing to get you. You will. We'll do it in chunks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Cool. How many years have you been in business now as of this year? This year would be 32. 32 okay. years. Yeah. Okay. So 32 years. Well, it'll be 32 years with FUBU. It would be, um, I, first, I started my first business when I was 16. I'm 52 now. So uh, 38 years, some, 36, something like that. Okay. All right. So looking back, looking back on what you've learned over that period of time, and you've been, you've been very, very fortunate to be around some, uh, some amazing people to yeah. tap into. You know, you've got... You know, as as much as I dislike Mr. Wonderful, I also admire him because I know that I know that he's I know he sh I know he shows the devilish side of him, but I also know that he's actually got a big heart. You know, <laughs> so, so that, but with all of that being said, what do you wish you knew when you began? What would be like, oh damn, if I only knew this, it would have made it would have made my efforts a hell of a lot 
easier. Finance. Finance. Fiscal responsibility. How money works. Period. Because mm. um, then I would have I would have skipped so many times losing it. I would have skipped so many times getting the door slammed on my face because I didn't know how to how money worked and what was in it for the bank or the banker or the VC or the angel investor and how I could have saved so much more time, how I could have probably raised as, uh, you know, I was so happy to just get a deal. Now I see people going to get millions and millions and millions of dollars, um, which, you know, it, it, it's, it's great. I, I, but I also am somebody who can't sleep at night if I take a dollar of somebody's money and I can't make sure that they don't, they don't wake up the next morning with a dollar 10 or a dollar 20, a dollar 50. But, um, financial structure as well you know what i mean uh, you know um i had to learn it on the fly um and i risked a lot and and thank god by the grace of god that i made it um where i wasn't one of those hey what happened to that basketball player's money what happened to that what happened to mike tyson's money you know what i mean aren't, yeah. aren't you aren't you <laughs> yeah yeah exactly for those that are that are fortunate to know you of course people Come up and say, "Hey, can you introduce me to Damon?" And I and I and I guard I guard my relationships very 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 closely. I'm like, um, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Same with me. People always go, "Hey, man, I got this idea. It's a really big idea. I want to really pitch it to Cuban." Yeah. Um, and I go, "Okay, hey, well, can you introduce me to him?" No, because uh, I I got some ideas I want to pitch him too, but I'm not <laughs> pitching him. So That's right. no. <laughs> That's right. But with all of that being said, with what you there's one quality when people came because people always ask, you know, that they'll ask with the, you know, they'll ask with this, you know, you know, they'll always ask us, and I'll say, you know, and I said, you know, I said, D, I said, it was a very, it was, and I tell them how we met with the, the fast company article and, and how you have always been, you've always been extremely one reciprocal and gracious. Okay. And I tell people, I tell people those two things. I said, I said, you know, Damon, is very reciprocal. Damon doesn't take for granted actions and, and just, he just does not. And, right. and then also I say, the other thing is, is that there's a graciousness you in my eyes with my, uh, with our relationship, you have never forgotten. You've never gone like, Oh, I'm up here now. I'm no longer, you, you've never severed <laughs> that connection. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I hate people like that. It's disgusting <laughs> pigs. Yeah. Yes, yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I just, I find it truly one of the most notable traits when people say, so what's he like? I say, probably the most, one of the most gracious business people I've actually been honored to know. And he's well, just. Thank you. It's an honor. D. You too, though. Same thing. I appreciate it, man. Well, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a learning experience, but it's, yeah. but it's something that, but it, it's wonderful when it's real. It's wonderful yeah. when it's authentic and one, it's wonderful when you don't have to prompt it you know sometimes you kind of you gotta have to remind somebody of their humanity you know you gotta have to <laughs> eat a little bit <laughs> yeah and so from what i've seen i would suspect that that's always kind of been with you is that true yeah i think so because um you know um it doesn't take much to be nice to people it takes i think it takes more energy to be an asshole i i think that I, okay do some people deserve it, um, deserve to get it <laughs> sent to them a different way? Absolutely. And, and I have the fortune of being on Shark Tank where I can give it to you as, as hard as I want it. But I know, I know, first of all, Mr. Wonderful is uh, sharpening his dagger right next to me. He's going to give it. He's going to give you the business. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know. I remember the couple of times when. I was on the other side of it and somebody treated me like a person. And I was walking down the street one day. I think I was like, I was like 14. I was doing my co-op for first Boston. I was doing, um, I was a, a messenger and I saw, you know, for the people who are not, who aren't our age, but this guy was a massive superstar. This guy's name was Tony Randall and his, uh, he, he played Felix on the odd couple. Yeah. You got, now you got to think back then, 40 million, 50 million people watching him every single week in their living room. This is when those, 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 those couple of shows got football, got, got Super Bowl numbers, like the Muppets and everything. Mm -hmm. And he was walking down a block and I yelled out. I think I was on like Broadway. I yelled out. 
Alex, Tony Randall. <laughs> and he walked over to me and he bent down and said, yes, it is. How are you, young man? What are you doing? I said, I'm taking some packages over here. He said, I'm sure you're going to get those packages delivered the right way. Be safe. Thank you for talking to me. And he just walked down the block and it was Tony Randall and me. Nobody else in the universe was around just for that 15, 20 seconds. Yeah. Same thing happened with a very famous singer named uh, Phyllis Hyman, who ended up. Um, I, I remember. Yeah, she ended up dying um, years later, but she talked to me like that. And that I will I will remember that for the rest of my life. He made me feel like a special person. So, you know, why not be gracious to other people, you know, who generally are gracious to you? I mean, I just I just I find that I find that that is just, I, I find it also it pays off down the road, man. You know, you build up so much kind equity with people that the days that we are going to be canceled or somebody is going to say something about us or misinterpret or be too sensitive. There's going to a lot of people go. That's not him. That's not him. Yeah, I love that because I, yeah, I've, I've, I've had, I've had a few, a few people I've crossed. More often, they've been nicer. One I'll leave unnamed. I, I was big fan. He's a mu- musical performer, and I saw him on Twenty Third and Broadway, right by the Flatiron Building. And and the guy's tall, and called out his name. And he and, and he was and he was he was talking to somebody and he kind of looked at me irritatedly, <laughs> <laughs> not realizing that his aura had had an impact on me, dude. I didn't mean you know it's like I, I'm not going to now apologize that you you know you're I'm a big fan of the shit you put out and I'm not going to apologize that I may have interrupted that, but I really am a fan and we will probably never see each other again. Anyway, he couldn't he really couldn't give too much of a shit and kind of like fluff me up. It, it wasn't it was not and not a gracious thing but that was he's kind of a bit of a tortured soul as a, yeah. you know i mean that's his thing and it's like okay fine you know right. and I'm, i didn't i didn't hold against some big shit but but that graciousness thing goes an enormously long way an enormously long way yeah so, i mean there's there's a lot of different things going on socioeconomic culturally this that the other technologically all kinds of stuff and i i'm just curious what do you what do you see as what business owners and entrepreneurs should be leaning into into to be relevant and as far as I'm concerned to rise to right above that that noise that crap you know because there's a lot of bullshit there's a lot of stupid stuff going on but in terms of business there's a lot of opportunities I'm curious what you see going forward um I, there's no one trend per se it's just <clears throat> you do have to stand for something today um and you will not make everybody happy whatever you stand for everybody is everybody's got an opinion and a problem and you just can't be concerned with their opinion and a problem if you are doing what you feel is the right thing and some people's right thing is the wrong thing as we all know some of the most tragic things in history has happened because somebody was trying to do what they call the right thing but whatever it is, you can't change who you are. You can't change what you want to be and who you want to strive to become. I just, I'm optimistic. I hope that most people will do the right thing and be on the side of the right thing and be proud enough. You know, um, there is that, I'm not sure who it was. I think it was Gandhi or somebody said, when you stand on the, when you stand silent during times of injustice, you're on the side of the oppressor. And I think that as we start to see more and more things unfold, you know, the 10% of the people that are fighting the cause for whatever it is, they're hand in hand together, whether it's there are different sexes or different sexual beliefs or different race, creeds, colors, whatever, but they're banding together for something they see in injustice. You don't need to convince them. You don't need to convince the other percentage that do believe in hatred, do believe that somebody else because of their color, their gender, the creed is holding them back. And if they, or if they keep them silent, they'll make more. You don't need to convince them either. They've already bought into a certain philosophy. It's the 80% that are right here going, 
uh, it'll work its way out. Oh, it's not really that serious. I, I'm not sure. Uh, that's who needs the convincing to say, no, this is, we're all in this together. You got to get, you got to, you got to, you got to make a positive effort towards this. And it makes it all better for you, for me, and all of us collectively. And I think that uh, you're starting to see a lot of people who are like, listen, I'm on this course, whatever it is, again, cleaning up the ocean. It could be stopping human trafficking. It could be, you know, everybody with two cents should be able to participate in the stock market and and not have a wall up before them and they need to be able to live the American dream, whatever it is. So again, I'm seeing businesses, people, um, you know, uh, everybody saying, we got to stand for something. And if you don't understand what we stand for, no problem, but we're going to stand for this anyway. And we're going to help. I love that. I love that because that, that is, that is vitally important. And, and especially at this time when there's so much people are so hypersensitive to maybe saying something incorrect that might offend someone, or they're going to hit tap into the cancel culture or the, this, or that, all that stuff that it is, it has turned us into collectively into uh we're, we're so damn cautious we've stopped freaking communicating yeah 100 percent. you know it's like enough the only le- remaining thing is is for the record i love whenever you say i'm chocolate thunder and i just go i'm white lightning that's what i tell people i, <laughs> say, they, <laughs> I say i say david goes well he goes i'm chocolate thunder. i said that's the that's the way we spoke back in Queens. <laughs> yeah. You know, we just, we just, we just took on something and we just like, okay, that's my badge. That's right. That's right. That's what I stand for. And I'm like, man, <laughs> if D's going to be chocolate thunder, well, I'm going to be white lightning. And that's there. right, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, man. Well, that's, well, that's beautiful. That's, I, there's some gems there and I appreciate you making the time of man. I really do. All right. Thanks D. 100%. Bye. Bye.